Welcome back to Introduction to Computational Fluid Dynamics. I'm Professor Steve Miller. Today we'll be talking about our last part of our module in turbulence. That is the direct numerical simulation DNS or large eddy simulation, LES. In our previous class, we looked at particular physical considerations for the idea of compressible flows. For compressible flows, the closure can be simplified by using the mass averaged weighting, which is of course the Favre averaging technique. Then we looked at some particular flow closures, at least at an overview level and not in detail like the incompressible form. We then looked at how they improve predictions with higher speed flows and then talked about a number of applications. That closes our basic RANS discussions. In this particular class, we're going to focus more so on a totally different types of simulation that resolves the unsteady time data. These fall into two classes. The first, of course, is direct numerical simulation. Direct numerical simulation directly integrates with a time marching method and fully resolves all scales of turbulence from the integral scales to the smallest scales, that is the Kolmogorov scales, by directly integrating the equations of motion, which are the Navier-Stokes equations. We'll look at some of these first. At surface level, these might be seemingly the easiest simulations, of course, to conduct, but you'll see there's some tricks to it, which, of course, are due to the amount of computational power it takes. Then we'll look at large eddy simulation, which directly accounts for the largest scales in the flow, which contain most of the energy. The smaller scales are then modeled through their own type of numerical implementation based on theory. LES has become very popular today in research and industry, and DNS, of course, remains mostly in research. Let's turn our attention first to DNS, or direct numerical simulations. DNS stands for direct numerical simulation, which is a wonderful name given the fact that you are, if you are performing a DNS, directly solving the Navier-Stokes equations themselves while resolving all scales of motion, including those and associated with the initial condition, which is how the flow is initially, and the boundary conditions of the particular flow. Technically, we could perform a DNS simulation and set up for any type of CFD problem, but you'll see it's harder said than done. Many students, often when they're starting in CFD, would think that they should just do everything with DNS. After all, if the equations of motion are being fully resolved and found numerically to a very, very high order of accuracy and precision for a particular case, then we should just use that and not worry about all this turbulence modeling and other exotic techniques you'll see we're bounded by computational power, and a lot of the cases we wish to examine will not be able to. We'll look at examples of those in this particular class. Now, as I mentioned, it's conceptually the most straightforward and easiest approach. It should be technically the easiest to program, because it's just the Navier-Stokes equations, and it should be straightforward because we're directly finding their numerical solutions, which are basically using the techniques that many students learned previously in their numerical methods class, basic finite differencing and basic time integration techniques with implementation of boundary conditions. And there's no strange turbulence models to worry about. Now the computational cost, of course, is gonna be very, very high. And why is that? Well, it's because of the so-called turbulence cascade and the many decades of turbulence, that is their length scales, from the very, very small scales all the way up to the very, very largest scales. And so for these reasons, they will be the most computationally intensive simulations. One of the major methods to solve a DNS flow field, that is, if we simply want to study homogeneous turbulence, is to use the so-called pseudo-spectral approach. In the numerical part of the class, we discuss the basics of spectral and pseudo-spectral approaches that is somehow solving part of the problem in the so-called Fourier domain and frequency or wave number. This makes a lot of sense to represent our solutions in this fashion because, of course, they will be more computationally efficient and have higher order of accuracy, sometimes spectral-like accuracy if we so desire. A pseudo-spectral approach combines traditional finite differencing approaches with spectral methods. For example, we'll examine particular terms spectrally and par other particular terms with a finite difference approach. As you remember, the spectral approaches will require certain constraints on a particular domain. Now, DNS today is particularly used almost entirely in research to study turbulence itself. It's a technique used by turbulence researchers to study turbulence. Only in the very, very lowest Reynolds number flows, their laminar and creeping, would DNS typically be used to really study the physics in a research environment or make some sort of actual prediction of a very slow speed flow.
So for these problems, to introduce DNS, we'll use this particular technique because, of course, it's advantages and widespread use in, of course, the research community. Imagine we have a cube with side lengths L. It's in three-dimensional, of course. Each side is L, the length. We now will represent a particular field variable, for example, u by its vector u at any point space x and time t will be the sum over its wave numbers kappa. These are the same wave numbers shown previously. The argument of the summation will have e to the i kappa with its inner product of the vector x with u hat of kappa t. You can recognize this, of course, as like an inverse transform. It's transforming the wave number space to x, the physical space. Remember, kappa is wave number. So this is nothing but a Fourier transform taken in each spatial direction of the code to transform the velocity from an x coordinate to its wave number. Now, in total for three dimensions, we'll have n cubed wave numbers. And n will normally be chosen to be in the powers of two. Why? Of course, this is true because of the advent of the discrete or fast Fourier transform, which has a restriction on the number of points within the transform, the discrete points to be a factor of two. For example, 128, 256, 4096, et cetera, are wonderful examples of powers of two to the n, which are typically used in 2020 to do these types of calculations. This means the number of grid points in the x, y, and z direction along our cube L would be, say, 128 in each particular direction. And we'll look at examples of this later to make it more concrete. Now the lowest non-zero wave number, which we might resolve, would then be approximately 2 pi over L, because of course this is a particular um, uh, wavelength with the distance of the domain. And of course n cubed wave numbers would be represented. And we can rewrite our wave number vector in this form here, where k naught of course is the, the wave number, uh, magnitude operating with some direction n. E are, of course, the vector components. So the largest wave number we could resolve then is pi n over L, though we're breaking the Nyquist criteria. But for now, let's just go with this as an example to illustrate the methodology. Now the spectral representation is going to be the same as u in physical space on a particular n cube uniform grid spacing. So to set the grid point spacing, we might take a script L divided by, of course, the number of points. We should really put in a factor here to account that we need more than technically a few grid points to represent a particular wave number. You take, typically need maybe 7 to 11 grid points per wavelength, and so there's an extra restriction here which we're not taking into account. That's the Nyquist criteria, the number of grid points, of course, to resolve a particular wave. Now or to other type of flow structure. We've talked about this previously in our numerical methods section. Anyway, we could replace our values in here from before and find that delta x should be going as pi divided by, of course, the maximum wave number. Now, discrete Fourier transforms will give, thankfully, a one-to-one -one mapping between the Fourier coefficients and the velocities of u at each particular grid point where there's n cube of them. And so we would be taking a Fourier transform at every time step and its corresponding inverse at every particular grid point on the x, y, and z plane faces of the cube. And that's a lot of um, computational expense. Now. The spectral methods will involve Fourier modes of u in small time steps t. This would result in approximate computational cost of n to the 6. What does this mean? It means that if we want to increase our range of turbulence that's resolved, the number of scales, which is very, very large for, of course, high level turbulence, then our computational cost is going to go as n to the 6 operations. This is actually a need for very, very um, conservative estimate. It's ideal. Now the spectral methods will evaluate the nonlinear terms in the Navier-Stokes equations. The other terms within the Navier-Stokes equations will be evaluated with traditional methods. They'll also be marched in time with perhaps a wrench cut of scheme. So using this approach with a pseudo-spectral one, we would only have n cubed log n operations. So by using a purely spectral approach, which would use 
Fourier transforms on all terms in the Navier Stokes equations, we could use a combined approach of traditional finite differencing and spectral theory through Fourier transforms and reduce the computational cost by from n to the six to n cubed log n. You should also note that for DNS, it's been applied to many types of basic flow fields to study turbulence. That being said, today it's mainly used to study the so-called periodic boundary conditions that are so often applied on a cubic domain. And so you can imagine if we have a cubic domain with periodic boundary conditions, meaning the flow can move through the sides, that indeed we would be modeling with some initial condition and corresponding periodic boundary conditions, a homogeneous isotropic turbulence which extends in infinite space. Let's now continue our estimation of the computational cost for a typical DNS simulation. Now, one would typically wish to have at least eight integral length scales within the domain. If we have a domain of length L and we try and put a single wave number in it, it will likely be relatively unresolved. This is sort of like the opposite end of the spectrum from the Nyquist criteria, which of course talks about grid point spacing for resolving larger scales. That means we want to have eight integral length scales within our domain at the start of the simulation. Therefore, we would take our base wave number, kappa naught, or the lowest wave number, which represents the largest scales, multiplied by its particular integral length scale in the x direction. It would go with a particular length of the domain, given our definition of wave number, 2 pi over L, essentially, as pi over 4, which goes as 0 0.8 for this particular domain. That's one bound for the lowest wave number. Now recall, if we know something about the viscosity and the integral wave number, we can estimate the smallest scales. So we can estimate grid point spacing according to Kamogorov theory. We would say that the grid point spacing delta x divided by the smallest length scale, or Kamogorov length scale, as pi over 1.5, which would give us about 2.1. This is not a huge range for these particular values, but as the Reynolds number increases, of course, the decade between L and eta increases, the number of decades. And we would expect very, very, very small grid point spacing as Reynolds number increases, given the same, of course, integral wave, scale, wave number. So now with these tools, we can try and estimate the total number of modes in one particular direction, x, y, or z of our domain. And it would go as something like two times, of course, the highest wave number divided by the smallest. We can then try and input our two relations here of L integral length scales, and of course, eta, smallest length scales. Substituting these in and simplifying, we'll find a term like this, 12 pi of L11 over L times L over eta. Here, L is going to be a length scale, which we'll just define and estimate as the turbulent kinetic energy of the flow at any particular time, times 3 half over epsilon. This could be done with some initial turbulent kinetic energy estimation at the beginning of the simulation. So if we have the total number of no, modes, excuse me, in one particular direction, we can should n cube it. We'll find a particular, the number of modes will go as n cubed as 4.4 times the integral Reynolds number based on the integral length scale to the 9 fourth power. That would go, if we simplify it, as 0 0.04 times the Reynolds number the t based on the Taylor length scale. This is the Taylor Reynolds number. Recall their Taylor length scale when we talked about, of course, turbulence theory to the 9 halves power. This is a very interesting equation. So you can see 9 divided by 2 is, of course, 4.5. So the Taylor Reynolds number to the 4.5 times a constant dictates how the number of modes will increase in the flow to the cube power, of course. Same for integral Reynolds number, which is, of course, is just 9 over 4. These don't seem like very large powers, but you'll see in a second they are in practice. One might ask, how do the number of Fourier modes in each particular direction of the domain increase with a particular adequate and necessary resolution for an isotropic homogeneous case? This is really illustrated on the figure in the middle of your page. The x-axis is the logarithm of the Taylor Reynolds number, 10, 100, 1000. A Taylor Reynolds number of 10 or 100 is actually rather small and does not represent extremely high Reynolds number turbulence. On the left and y, on the left y-axis and the right y-axis, we have n and n cubed, which of course is the number of modes in the domain. 
For example, at a Taylor-Rose number of 1,000, we have about 10 to the 12th number of modes in the computational domain, which, for only a very small number of 1,000, is an incredible number of modes which are being, being resolved by the CFD. It's also significant because it's extremely computationally expensive. Remember, this is an estimate based on the Fourier decomposition. This is just spatial constraint. We also have to think about temporal. Recall the CFL number, and it must be small enough to advance in time so the solution is not stable, and we need to make an unsteady simulation in advance in time. We'll make an estimate of the CFL number, which goes now as kappa instead of, say, some other value like u. We'll rewrite our CFL number as kappa to the one-half times delta t over delta x. Delta x is fixed by our constraints on the decomposition of the domain. Kappa, of course, is our range of wave numbers, which we've already examined, and we would restrict based on the delta x parameter. And, of course, the integral length scale and Kamagraf length scale. So we only can choose delta t. For small and mat Perhaps delta t is chosen, so for stability of our particular scheme, one estimate might give us some factor of about just ballpark for estimation purposes, 1 over 20. This is a very reasonable estimation given delta t's for stability. The duration of the simulation, given that we want to resolve so many eddy turnover times, let's just say we only want to do four turbulent eddy time scales resolved in our unsteady simulation, only four, which is very, very small. We'll try and estimate the duration of the simulation. We estimate it should be at least four times the turbulent length scales, just as an estimate. Here we'll say four times a time scale divided by the time step, which should be rather large, will fill in 1 over 20, which gives us approximately 80 L over delta X. So here we're equating and estimating just on a rough amplitude magnitude, the time scales go as, of course, just like L over delta x for tau. Filling in the numbers and simplifying from previous L over eta versus Reynolds number, well, from our Kamogorov theory, we will find a value of about 9.2 times Taylor Reynolds number to the 3 halves. So this is also a large power, which of course is greater than 1. For a large Taylor Reynolds number, this will also increase, of course, the required duration of the simulation to resolve in approximately four time scales of turbulence, integral time scales. Let's now put this on a cost basis. Typically, a computer, a digital computer, might use 1,000 floating point operations per mode per time step. This estimate is just based on the implementation of a typical solver. Now, what would be the time in, say, days for a single 1 gigaflop computer as of 2020 to make a calculation for a given Taylor Reynolds number? Well, the time in days will go as 10 cubed times the number of spatial modes times m, which was estimated on the previous slide. We found n and m as function of Reynolds number. The terms in the denominator, of course, convert to time in days. If we fill in Taylor Reynolds number with respect to integral Reynolds number, we would have a value of Taylor Reynolds number to the 6 divided by 70 to the 6. We can now graph this relation of the time in days versus, say, Taylor Reynolds number. Let's look at this on the right. You'll see it on the y-axis we have the time in days to complete the simulation. On the x-axis we have, of course, Taylor Reynolds number. Now remember, this is a very, very simplified flow. Here, of course, the dots are actual simulations that were performed, and these quantities were tracked. For example, the simulation here that took the longest was approximately two days, and it only had, on a gigaflop computer, a Taylor Reynolds number of about 70 to 80. The lines here, of course, are the theoretical or trend line predictions which we've shown in this equation in development in this class. Over on the left, we show the numerical data. Let's look at these particular columns together. In the first column, we have Taylor Reynolds number. Now, the second not... column is integral Reynolds number. This is the one that you typically are most familiar with. It's based on a large length scale of velocity and a viscosity. Recall what kind of Reynolds numbers you were dealing with in your previous classes, where you were looking at simple, low-speed laminar flows. An example of a high Reynolds number flow might be in the millions, if not tens or hundreds of millions, if not a billion for very high speed flow.
the Reynolds number listed here are only, say, 94, which is very, very, very small for a turbulent case, and it goes all the way up to an estimate of 96,000. Now, we also look at, say, the number of modes in one and three dimensions. So, for example, at an integral Reynolds number of 94, Teller Reynolds number of 95, we have a linear mode of 104 and a cubic mode of 1.1 times 10 to the 6. Temporally, we would have 1.2 times 10 cubed. If we multiply to two together, like in our following formula, which we showed on this page, we'll have 1.3 times 10 to the ninth. If we calculate the CPU time, we can then write it in the last column. For example, an integral Reynolds number of 94 would take 20 minutes of a computer time on a gigaflop computer. That's related to the number of floating point operations, of course, per second. Now, if we have our Reynolds number of only, say, 24,000, we could calculate and estimate that our simulation would take 90 years to complete on this particular computer. If our Reynolds number was 96,000, then of course the simulation would take 5,000 years to complete. And that is a very, very low Reynolds number for an aerospace type flow. We've also had many restrictions on this particular CFD solver. It is written to be highly efficient and highly accurate. It does not handle any kind of complicated boundary conditions. And it certainly doesn't handle any kind of multi-physics like combustion or particularly difficult types of acoustics. In fact, these simulation results are for an incompressible solver, so it would be impossible for them to handle shocks. The bottom line is, if you include none of those effects and you want to simulate a realistic high Reynolds number flow in the millions, then you would have to use all the computer power for all human history and it would not complete in the total time that the universe has been in existence. This is rather disturbing. And this is one reason why high Reynolds number DNS simulations have not been completed today and likely within our lifetimes as of 2020 in the making of this video. Let's now talk about DNS for the inhomogeneous turbulence. We've talked at length about how DNS is applied to isotropic homogeneous turbulence. But what if we want to take the equations of motion with a particular computational domain and boundary conditions and everything else we talked about and simply try and calculate the cases directly? This is being indeed done today, but as I just explained, it always must be done in very, very, very small domains to restrict the number of grid points and or very, very small Reynolds numbers. Now, the Fourier representation will not be able to be used in particular directions where there's inhomogeneous turbulence. That means if the statistics of turbulence are changing with respect to space, we would not take a Fourier transform in that direction and not get a wave number. We would have to use all our traditional techniques. Also, the physical boundary conditions are still required, as in the ones we've talked about previously in this very class. Finally, Motions near the wall, which are more so characterized by viscous length scales, that is, in the turbulent bounds there, will impose additional and higher resolution constraints on the DNS simulation. So we'll have to put many grid points near the turbulent bondular, as shown and discussed previously on our discussion of the turbulent bondular composite profiles. That is, you'll have to have many more grid points near the wall than out in the domain where there's, of course, larger scales, and they may not have to um, have the same small scales near the wall. In a particular case. So let's look at a particular application to illustrate the DNS. Now let's say our Reynolds number is about 51,000 for a backward facing step. We would define our Reynolds number as the velocity of the incoming flow times the height of the step divided by viscosity. We of course get 51,000. The corresponding experiment cannot be performed accurately and measurements taken accurately at such a low Reynolds number. So the corresponding experiment actually has a higher Reynolds number of 500,000. Now, for this particular case, for DNS, it will take approximately 54 days on a contemporary Cray supercomputer using shared memory. The lower part of the screen, of course, is our computational domain. H is the step height. There's a computational domain of 10h before the step and 20h after. The domain is 4h wide and 6h high, as can be seen. So it's a very simple domain with a very low Reynolds number for, of course, DNS. Let's look at the particular metrics of the grid, CPU time, etc. And mind you, the computer is shown in the lower right. 
uh, for scale, this is the height of a taller than a person. The number of nodes, computational grid points in the x, y, and z direction are 786, 192, and 64. So therefore, the total number of grid points is 8.3 times 10 to the 6. That's only 8.3 million. As of 2020, that's not very large. Now, the number of time steps we took is 2.1 times 10 to the 6. We want to find the full flow, make sure it's statistically stationary, and then integrate over multiple time scales, integral time scales. Then, of course, if we multiply n by m, we'll get 1.8 times 10 to the 12. This is, the, of course, the total number of so-called node steps in the particular DNS simulation. A crazy 90 was used, which is an older computer, of course, today, relative to the writing, and it took 1,300 CPU hours to complete this very simple low Reynolds number simulation. That's a particular inhomogeneous case for a backward-facing step. Let's look at something more contemporary. This one came out of, of course, Moyne's group, Professor Moyne at Stanford, and two of his postdocs and students. It shows, of course, Q criterion. This represents a DNS of a zero-pressure gradient flat turbulent boundary layer. So they did a boundary layer case where they, of course, have fully resolved the turbulence. You can see how many modes and structures of turbulence are in here. It is a fully developed flow. The particular Reynolds number is based on, of course, momentum thickness, which is only 80 at x equals 0.1 to 1,000 at x equals 3.5. The grid size is 4,096 points in the x direction, 400 in the y direction, 128 in the z direction. So there's a lot of grid points here, and it certainly is a very large simulation. Running and coding in DNS is very straightforward relative to other types of flows. Of course, because it doesn't have the turbulence closure. But of course, the penalty is it must be very high order accuracy, and to produce any kind of meaningful result, it has to very, use very, very large computers. This is why we're not running DNS in this particular class, because of, you, of course, if you're running it on your laptop, then you'll have very, very limited and low Reynolds number results, which would just look like linear waves bouncing around in a little cubic domain. It wouldn't be very interesting. It could be done as an exercise for fun, and there's many open source DNS codes available on the internet if you want to try one yourself. It is true, of course, that DNS, direct numerical simulation, will provide accuracy that is unequaled, because of course it's resolving all scales of turbulence. You are truly finding a numerical solution to a specific set of boundary conditions and initial conditions of the Nave Stokes equations. It's very likely that your formulation will be incompressible, because of course it's cheaper and most DNS solvers are written for incompressible flows, mainly because, of course, the realistic wave Reynolds number you can obtain, obtain is very, very small. Today, DNS is used exclusively for research. It is not used in industry to do design of aircraft or design of other devices, unless the flow is very, very low Reynolds number or it's a creeping flow entirely. And then, of course, it'd be a Stokes flow and you wouldn't need to get a nonlinear term anyway. There is basically no other way in existence to obtain these types of data sets. Experimentally, it would be impossible to measure in three dimensions an isotropic homogeneous turbulence field. Therefore, the DNS results are indisputably an amazing tool to study numerical solutions of fluid dynamics. That is to say, they are still limited by the errors inherent in computers, which are discrete, which we discussed earlier in the class. They, all those assumptions and errors are still present in DNS. That being said, you might still wonder, hey, are these solutions actually numerically accurate? They are numerical solutions. They're not actual solutions of the real full Navier-Stokes equations in their original continuum form. Some DNS studies actually change the Navier-Stokes equations themselves and are modified for research purposes to see what would happen. It's a mathematical type study. We also have to say that because of the amount of computer power used, DNS costs a tremendous amount of power. Imagine taking over one of the world's largest supercomputers for days, weeks, or even a month at a time. You would have to pay for, of course, all the computer costs, all the power, all the insurance and all the people and many other factors and fees, it's all lumped up into a single bill that a researcher might have to pay with perhaps a research grant. It is as expensive as simply running out a wind tunnel and taking the measurements, which might be much cheaper and of course give you a high Reynolds number flow that you care about. So it's realistically limited because of cost and computer power. Remember, for high Reynolds number DNS, there is not enough computer power 
that has been created in existence to resolve the flows and find a solution in a time scale which is smaller than the length of our lives. Furthermore, as a final point for DNS, you'll see that the majority of the computer power and costs will be for resolving the dissipation range. That's because most of the energy resides in the largest scales of turbulence. So those who are doing research in DNS thought to themselves, well, what if I spend 1% of my computer power resolving the majority of the energy and dynamics of the flow and model the small scale structures? which is where most of the computer costs would be spent, and I could get rid of it. This is the idea and motivation for LES, to do a time resolve simulation to resolve the largest scale structures and only model and not integrate through the computer and resolve the small scale structures. It's a brilliant idea. This brings us in to the idea of large eddy simulation. Large eddy simulation will be simulations that are typically three dimension because we want to study turbulence and turbulence must be in three dimensions truly, of unsteady motions that are directly represented whereas the effects of the smaller motions are modeled. So we won't use all our computational power to resolve all the small scales, we'll model them. Just like in RANS we looked for closures, a type of model. Now we'll try and create a type of model for the smaller scales. If we can do this successfully, then large eddy simulation would be less expensive than DNS, but more expensive than RANS or unsteady RANS. You'll know I wrote URANS to emphasize that we're running an unsteady case. But remember, by definition, RANS is unsteady. The RANS equations have time dependent terms like partial, partial t. So if someone says RANS, it truly is unsteady. If they say steady RANS, then they mean that the time terms have been removed. Now, it's typically more accurate than the RAND simulations, that is LES, typically, but not always. Now, there's four major steps to large eddy simulation, and here they are. First, the filtering operation will decompose the velocity into the sum of a filtered component and a residual or subgrid component. That is, our filter is going to model scales of turbulence that are smaller than the smallest grid point spacing. That's called the subgrid component. Then we might filter the velocity field as derived from the Navier-Stokes equations. There'll be a closure for modeling the residual stress tensor, which of course is subgrid scale, by adding an eddy viscosity model. An eddy viscosity model and those ideas came from RAND's modeling, but now we're applying it to a filtered or subgrid scales of motion. Though the model filtered equations will be solved numerically, and this provides an approximation to large scale motion in one realization for the turbulent flow. If you want to see a video of a basic LES of a jet flow, I've put one here in this YouTube link, which of course is a video that my one of my students made of his LES simulation of a jet. Now there's various types of large eddy simulation, and they have been developed for different kinds of flows. If you run an LES, you'll have to be very sure that you're using the kind that's appropriate for the problem. Let's talk about classifications of LES before we show examples and a few equations. The first, of course, is DNS turbulence is resolved for all scales. So this is not really an LES case. This is the DNS case. That's a general case. The next level might be an LES where we filter and find a grid that is sufficiently fine to resolve 80% of the energy. So if we look at our wave number energy spectrum and I find 80% of the energy, that's being resolved by a technique that's just like DNS, and we've modeled the smaller scale structures. There's also the idea of very large eddy simulation, which of course is where the grid is very, very large and we can't resolve at least 80% of the simulation. These are just basic classifications. But usually if you just say LES or LES with well-resolved modeling, those are the two major types and cases. The second case where you're resolving near the wall might have a wall model itself, which we briefly discussed um, in an earlier section, and of course, just having enough grid points to model the turbulence in the wall, which is extremely expensive. So let's talk about these filtering techniques and how they might be used to try and do an LES simulation so you can understand it of its main process. So a low pass filter, that is a filter that removes higher wave numbers, will be performed and the resulting velocity field will be resolved on a coarse grid. The filtering operation can be shown in the first equation. So the filtered velocity, we'll call bar, and notice this is not a time average quantity because it's x and t, this is a filtered velocity. 
so it's not time averaged, will go as an integral of g, which is what we call the normalization condition, times the velocity of x minus rt, and we integrate over r. Notice this is integrating over r, which is indeed a spatial vector from the point x. r is a vector. So we're integrating in three-dimensional space, the vector r. It is removed, and we're finding a function that's only x and t in this particular operation. G has some particular properties, and there's many different types of filters. There's no one single type of filter which is perhaps best. It's an object of research to try and choose a filter for G. But it does always have the normalization condition that if we integrate G over dr, it will have a value of 1. You can imagine a few different types of functions like G, perhaps like a Gaussian envelope. Nonetheless, the residual of the field will then be defined, that is, the fluctuating residual will go as the original variable, u, which is unfiltered, the actual value, minus the filtered value. So you can see this is very much like the classic Reynolds decomposition, but the base value, that is u bar here, what is that? That is, of course, the filtered velocity field. So the fluctuating velocity itself, that is the residual of the field, goes as the actual velocity minus its filtered velocity. So do not look at this and think about Reynolds averaging, because of course Reynolds averaging will remove time. Now the velocity field will have a particular decomposition, and we'll let that decomposition go, go as u equals u bar plus, of course, u prime. And I forgot the plus symbol here, I apologize. So we will require that the residual is non-zero, of course, too. And it shouldn't be because of this general operation. Now you might be asking, what are particular types of filters? And if you run an LES simulation, you'll realize that you're filtering out the velocities to only obtain the large scales. So this filter is designed, of course, it's low pass, to find the low wave numbers, which represent the largest scales of turbulence. And you can choose G, and there's many choices. Here's a few particular forms of G. On the left, line are some famous ones, a general filter, boxes, Gaussian, sharp spectral methods, Cauchy filters, and Powell filters. And we of course define a filter function g and a transfer function for g. So this filter function c g r for general, uh, this is just the general forms, we might put in the Gaussian one which I was talking about. So you would take this form of the equation here and put it in for g on the top of 16. That would of course give us the filtered result. Nonetheless, it's up to the LES code to choose a particular filter, and you can change it through. Let's look at examples of this particular filtering op operation. On the left, we have our particular filter window. This particular filter shows two types. The dashed one is the box filter. And you can see there's sort of like a box around R over delta. Delta is just some normalized spacing. G, of course, is the filter. And if we integrate any of these functions, we will, of course, find a, um, uh, the value of 1 if we integrate from negative infinity to infinity. The Gaussian filter, which I mentioned before, is a solid line. It's just a Gaussian envelope, which comes up, rises up, and falls down again. Finally, a sharp spectral filter, which has some sort of oscillations about 0 in it, goes up and follows a Gaussian curve and comes down. Uh, which is close to Gaussian, excuse me, and has oscillation. So these are just three filter types, and there's advantages and disadvantages for different types of filters. Now let's take a time-varying signal. Say we just take a time-varying signal, we can take it from measurement uh, with a hot wire and a turbulent flow. On the right, we show the effects of these particular filters. These particular filters are examples of the Gaussian filter. Here, the velocity field will be capital U and the y-axis are units of velocities. The x-axis represents space. Remember, we're filtering over space because we want to find the largest scales of turbulence spatially. The very fine line represents the original fluctuation. The solid line represents the filtered value. Capital U bar represents the filtered result. The prime value represents, of course, the residual result above the filtered result. So now through this singular approach, we've decomposed our fluctuating quantities into two parts. Of course, there are u bar and u prime bar from the original values u and u prime. It's a simple and straightforward mathematical operation, a spatial filter. It's very much like a basis function, and of course, 
with basis functions, we could have chosen Fourier decomposition. And we could have just chosen the lower Fourier modes. This would be a different type of filter. This one's a little bit more general because, of course, we can define our filter function however we want to find the low wave numbers. Let's now look at the effects of filters, in particular wave number space, which would be much more useful for LES. So suppose that U of X has a Fourier transform. So once we found U through the filter, we could, for fun, take the Fourier transform. So a Fourier transform will be represented by script F operating on U. So it's a spatial Fourier transform that converts the spatial corner from X to kappa. Now, the Fourier transform of the filtered velocity will be, of course, equal to its Fourier transform of G times the Fourier transform of U. That's shown here. So Fourier transform of U, it will be the hat, U hat. So the hat operator shows the signification of the Fourier transform. See the hat operator. G is the Fourier transform of the filtered values. So for example, if we are Gaussian filter, we take this and Fourier transform it from R to kappa, it's a spatial filter, it'll go as e to the negative kappa squared delta squared over 24. That's what we see in this particular equation. And so you can see the filtering operation is very much like the Fourier transform operation given a particular filter g. Now, if this is true, and it corresponds to, of course, the Fourier transform operation and filter, then g should probably take a particular form. Now you might ask, of course, what's the Fourier transform of g of r? Well, I've shown that on the previous slides and in a column for a few different examples, but we can also show it mathematically. If we take the integral of g of r, e to the negative i kappa r, dr, then of course we'll get a function of kappa. This would be equal to 2 pi times the Fourier transform of g. That's pretty straightforward. The 2 pi, of course, came out because of the prefactor. If we take the Fourier forward Fourier transform and the backward Fourier transform of G, then of course we want to find G itself again. That says the operation it's inverse should get the same value. It should satisfy the same normalization condition in R and kappa. That is, if we integrate over R, we should get one. In the Fourier domain, we should have a value of one at kappa equals zero. So think about the significance of having a sharp spectral filter in that it will eliminate all the Fourier modes of wave number kappa or greater. That is what we call a low-pass filter, and it's only obtaining low wave numbers or large scales applied to these values. And you can see that in this example here. See how the small thin lines have much more structure and very fine. It's almost like and it isn't, a time average, a short time time average was applied to the original data. This is a much more elegant way of, of course, finding these values. And it's, of course, a true filter at each particular spatial point. Now that we've examined and defined a particular filtering strategy for space, let's see how it fits in with the famous energy spectra of turbulence in the cascade. Consider a particular velocity fluctuation. We'll call that U. And we can decompose it into its, say, fluctuating quantity, capital U, minus its average or base quantity, U. This is like these little brackets from, represent the averaging technique. Earlier in the class, we defined autocorrelations. Here, we'll talk about autocovariance. So you see, this is essentially the averaging technique of U and U from the arguments of x plus r and x. So you see the autocovariance function, which operates on u, will be a function of the distance between two different velocities, of course, in the computational space. We can define from this two-point correlation, or autocovariance, the energy spectrum of u. We'll call the energy spectrum in one particular direction with a subscript of 1, 1. That'll be e is kappa. So we take our autocovariance and find a Fourier transform of it. We take r times e to the negative i kappa r dr. Here, of course, r is some distance along the vector in space. And we transform from that spatial coordinate involving r to wave number kappa. So we transform r to kappa. And now we have an energy spectrum based on the autocorrelance of the fluctuating velocity as it varies along some particular points on a vector in space in a turbulent field. Now let's try and think about the filtered form from the definitions we showed on the previous slide. 
If we wanted to filter the energy spectra, we would not have to go back to, say, the time domain or spatial domain values in step one. We would only have to multiply in wave number space by the magnitude of the Fourier transform of the filter squared. That can be shown here. And we can choose whatever form of the filter we so desire. There will be different types of filters, and these will be sometimes more appropriate or less appropriate for different types of flows. Now, based on this, recall our definition of the integral length scale from the earlier section on our introductions to turbulence. You'll see that we can define an integral length scale. It will go over as 1 over our operation squared times the integral of r dr. This r, of course, is the autocorrelation of the velocity along the vector r. Then we'll have a length scale. So now, using these particular properties, let's graph the energy on the right. Now, the x-axis is our integral length scale times wave number. So this is non-dimensional wave number on the x-axis. It's a log scale. L11 is a constant. It's it has units in meters, and kappa, of course, has units in 1 over meters. The y-axis is our energy spectrum, E11, which we define as the filtered or original energy spectrums, respectively, divided by a length scale and meter squared per second squared, which makes it non-dimensional. Now, this is also a log scale. You'll see that if we look at an amount of energy, it mostly is contained in the first decade. This is, of course, the integral range. This or this, the Kolmogorov scales. Here, roughly, is the Taylor micro scale, and here's that whole inertial range of turbulence. Here, you can see it's a straight line, roughly, on the, this particular log log graph. That's because, of course, it's falling into the Kolmogorov theory of turbulence. We apply the original, if we look at the original energy spectrum in the velocity scale, it's going to be the solid line. That's the actual energy on a per wave number basis in the turbulent flow. If we apply a filter, if we apply a filter, then we'll obtain this dash line. Now if we integrate the energy under, say, if we integrate E11 from kappa 0 to infinity, we'll find the total energy if we integrate the unfiltered energy spectrum. If we integrate the filtered energy spectrum with a particular grid point cutoff with this particular filter which we can set, then we'll find the inner area under the dash line, which also represents the total energy in the flow from wave number zero to about maybe 70. That amount of energy accounts for 92% of the total energy of the flow. The advantage is we've cut off the last entire decade of the wave number spectrum, which only accounts for about 8% of the energy. But most of the computational power to resolve this type of flow would be used to resolve the scales in the last decade. That's fascinating. So if we can do these filtering operations for a CFD simulation, then we would only have to resolve numerically the scales and energy in the lower wave numbers and model the higher wave numbers. That's the core idea behind large eddy simulation. So one might ask, now that we looked at these properties of the filtering operations and the filtering operation in the energy spectrum, how can I apply these ideas to the Navier-Stokes equations? Well, it's simple. The large eddy simulations would be solving the filtered Navier-Stokes equations, or if it's compressible, you might try and solve the filtered Fabry averaged equations. So we will apply our filtering operations, which we just defined directly onto the Navier-Stokes equations. These poor equations have been manipulated so many times. Now, look at the momentum equation as a particular example. These filtering operations apply equal to energy equations, uh, gas closures, combustion equations, or, and of course the beautiful continuity equation. We'll find a filtered momentum equation, partial u bar j partial t plus partial u i u j bar partial x equals the viscosity of partial 2 u partial x i partial x i minus 1 over rho partial p bar partial xj. Now the bars represent the filtered values, so they are also the resolved quantities of the field variables. We also have unresolved quantities. But you can see that this particular form is very, very familiar to the classic Navier-Stokes equation, but of course bar operators on the particular variables. It's also an incompressible form, mind you, so this has the incompressible assumption. Now, 
Another mathematical fact we must look at is for the nonlinear term, the second term of the momentum equation. Remember that the filtered product of ui uj will be different than, say, ui uj bar. And therefore, there's a difference in the filter residual stress. This is just like the Reynolds stress appearance for the Reynolds averaging. But now we're getting a very similar term in the same relative fashion, at least, as the filter operation on average Stokes. It's an amazing similarity. But it's no coincidence because of this operation. Therefore, we'll have some sort of little difference in the equations because of this. It's a filter residual stress tensor. We'll also, as you imagine, have a residual turbulent kinetic energy, which we'll write as K sub R for residual TKE. That's really the energy, of course, in the unresolved scales. This is, of course, goes as the trace of the stress tensor of the residual stress tensor, excuse me. And the residual stress tensor will go as bar UI UJ minus bar UI bar uj, which is a very simple definition. And so, of course, we have to deal with this particular nonlinear term. So with these particular definitions, we can rewrite our filter momentum equation from above. And we can write it as a material derivative of d bar uj over d bar t equals the viscous term of partial to uj bar, partial xi, partial xi, excuse me, this should be xj, minus partial of the residual stress of tau ij partial xi minus 1 over rho partial p bar partial xj, which is the same. And so we can apply very similar approaches to the other equations in motion and find similar terms. Now the problem with this approach, now that we have, of course, filtered the Navier-Stokes equations and are solving for the filtered values, is how do we model the other scales that we have not resolved in the flow, that is those at the high wave number ranges. The most typical and well-used and known approach is the so-called approach of Smagorinsky, who defines a particular length scale L sub s. The LES equations themselves, using the particular Smagorinsky model, will be solved to find the filtered velocity field. It's modeled. So there's a Smagorinsky closure, or subgrid scale model. All types of models in this class are called subgrid scale models because, of course, they're modeling the dynamics of the turbulence at the subgrid scale level, that is, at scales smaller than the smallest grid points. Now we'll let our energy spectrum with a bar be the energy spectrum in the filtered field, and E of kappa be the energy spectrum. So we have a new energy spectrum E and E bar. These are the same ones which we showed on slide 20. E will be the total energy and E bar will be the filtered we will try and define a transfer function between the filtered and unfilled load spectrum. We'll just call that G. This should sound a little familiar now. And we'll have a hat on G because it's operating, of course, on the Fourier transforms of the energy spectrums. We would also have a filtered small scale turbulence and length scale. So we define a new filtered Kamal-Groff scale. We'll call that bar eta. And we fill it in with the typical Kamal-Groff definitions. But instead now we have, say, uh, viscosities, we still have the same dissipation, but viscosities with un unresolved viscosity and a normal viscosity. And that will go as, if you simplify, a length scale of the unresolved scales as 1 plus these ratio of viscosity squared. So we can estimate, through our Kamal-Groff theory, a composite profile for the high wave numbers or Kamal-Groff area of the spectrum, the small scales. And that will go as E bar of kappa times some function, times a constant, times dissipation to two thirds, times wave number to the negative five thirds, times this exponential. So this is actually a composite spectrum of the filtered energy. It is a semi-empirical equation. Epsilon to the two thirds and capital to the negative five thirds are from the theory of Kamal-Groff. Why? Because of course that fills in the inertial range of turbulence which is larger than the wave number of the filtered scales. These two functions are to fit it to what a composite spectrum would look like of, of course, the solid line in this region, especially. You see it has a fall off of negative kappa to five thirds here, and then it transitions in this exponential decay. This exponential decay is shown as the last term of the estimated filter energy. And so we're superimposing this energy spectrum to model the energy of the unfiltered scales. Smagorinsky just then deduced from this particular form the so-called Smagorinsky filter, which is what's applied to filter, of course, the energies between the filtered energies 
and of course the total spectrum. And he writes g hat of kappa, that's of course the Fourier transform of the filter, will go as e to the negative three fourths c's times kappa to the four thirds times eta bar minus eta bar four thirds each. You'll see, remember, the bar is the filtered Kolmogorov scale, and eta is the actual Kolmogorov scale. This is the essence of the Smagorinsky model of what's being used in practice, which is the last equation. It's used in the majority of LES codes in production. There's, of course, more uh, advanced type of subgrowth scale models for different types of applications, especially those which don't fit in with the nice, fully developed turbulence of Kolmogorov's theory. There's a whole nother type of LES simulations which don't use subgrid scale filters at all. And some people said, why should I model the subgrids at all? Why don't I just let the computer numerics handle those scales? These are called implicit LES simulations. No explicit filtering will be performed and no residual stresses will be modeled. And therefore you can imagine it's a little bit cheaper than the traditional closure of the LES filtered equations. Numerical methods to solve the Navier-Stokes equations will attempt to find solutions for, say, all the barred quantities, that is, the filtered quantities. Of course, the grid is not fine enough to resolve all the small scales and numerical stresses which reside from the simulation. Therefore, we'll try and filter the residual stresses modeled, and it will be performed implicitly by the numerical method, just as before. So instead of a Smagorinsky subgrid scale model, for instance, we would be trying to filter and get rid of these Reynolds residual stresses through implicit numerical methods. How is this done in practice? Well, that energy at high wave numbers will simply be removed by numerical dissipation. Numerical methods, of course, have an additional numerical dissipation of the energy, uh, unless it's growing, and that will remove that higher energy so we don't have to model it. These types of techniques you'll see in literature and many types of CFD codes, it's called Miles Approach Monotone Integrated Large Eddy Simulation. And so instead of using physics to handle and model those subgrid scales, the smallest scales of turbulence, they're just getting rid of them, so to speak, with the idea of numerical dissipation, which is artificial, in fact. And it's not a physical thing, but yet these simulations have gained tremendous popularity in, in research and industry. The major advantage of these approaches is that energy will be removed from the numerics, and we don't care how the energy is removed, just so it's going away. But it certainly won't be converted necessarily into heat and acoustics, which is what's proper. Of course, the major disadvantage is, of course, is that the modeling will be separately coupled. That is, it will depend on the numerical method and the grid used, and it's not possible to prove grid independence with an implicit LES. It's very difficult to prove grid independence with an LES in general, because you would have to keep increasing the number of grid points until the simulation becomes a DNS anyway. And so grid independent studies on LES, in my view at least, are technically impossible because you would have to approach the DNS result. Let's look at some particular examples of large eddy simulations so you can find the power of these types of flows. This one is from Cascade, which is a company which came out of Stanford University essentially. The flow moves from left to right. The nozzle has a green color, and the white is the interior of the nozzle. The colors of red and yellow and dark red and black are, of course, colored in terms of the flow. This is a turbulent jet. At each cross-section A, B, C, D, and E, you'll see cross-sections of this turbulent LES simulation. You can see that how many scales of turbulence are resolving from the LES simulation. The very, very large scales resolve all the way down to like tiny little waves coming out, which represent acoustics. You can also see and you can see tiny little eddies of turbulence coming out of the major portion of the jet and it becomes fully developed downstream. So they're resolving a whole wide range of scales in a very expensive LES simulation, but of course the benefit is that it is very... Here's another example I've copied and pasted in here, and it's of course a combustor. So this LES type flow is modeling sprays, breakups, evaporation, and the combustion process. It's from the Center of Turbulence Research, which is also at Stanford. Here's another application of LES through a turbine. Here's an LES, uh, which I'm particularly fond of, of an oblique shock wave interacting with a turbulent bondular. So if we have a turbulent bondular attached to the wall, and we find its turbulence through LES in the whole simulation, you can see we can plot the Q criterion. Flow moves from lower left to upper right, and the bondular is growing, and they've colored it with some properties. Now you see the gray area which looks like planes, is actually the shock wave coming down, impinging on the boundary layer and bouncing off. 
In compressible flow, of course, we treat this problem with simple two-dimensional uh, approximations of isentropic theory with shockwave theory. You can see truly, even though this is a two-dimensional problem in statistical sense, in reality, it's highly three-dimensional. You can see how three-dimensional and chaotic the turbulence is and how the shockwave comes in and it disturbs it and bounces off. And also notice physically the shockwave never reaches the wall. It's actually bouncing off the surface, of course, of the turbulent boundary layer. The turbulence in, interacts with the shocks and it amplifies the shocks and turbulence. So the turbulence is actually being altered by the shockwave's interaction. It's a highly nonlinear process and one of the more difficult problems to study in fluid dynamics. Let's summarize some major takeaways from large eddy simulation. It is more than sufficient for the purposes to model energy in large scale structures because of course we're directly finding those large scale structures through the filtering approach. And we're solving almost exactly the same equations as before, the Navier-Stokes equations, but with a filter which is designed to capture the subgrid scales, like this Magorinsky model. We might also monotonically integrate or remove the smallest scales through just simple numerical methods, which is much easier to program, but perhaps less physical, but relies on the natural dissipation than numerics in the computer. LES today is excellent for studying large turbulent structures on aerospace flight vehicles and many other applications. It is becoming one of the de facto standards in, in entering industry quickly uh, for design purposes. But it is extremely expensive and likely the most expensive type of CFD simulation one can conduct next to DNS. In fact, if our LES is truly um, implemented correctly, if we increase the number of grid points, we should approach the DNS result. The problem with this, of course, is it's impossible to perform a true grid independent study for a high Reynolds number flow because, of course, we can't do a DNS result. And, of course, the solution is always changing because we are lowering the filter floor for high wave numbers. One might ask also, is LES, large eddy simulation, a complete turbulence model? And this is an argument in the community. But strictly speaking, I would argue that LES is an incomplete turbulence model because it's either going to depend on the specification of a filter and its width, that is where the filter cut off between resolved scales and filtered scales. And if it's implicit LES, that means there's no subgrid scale model, then there's no physical model for the smallest scales. And that can't be a complete turbulence model either. So for these reasons, it's considered, I think generally, by most of the community, an incomplete approach. But yet, it's still very powerful. It is very likely that in the future, LES will remain one of the do dominant and growing approaches in our field, especially as computer power increases and parallelization becomes more prevalent across our machines. Next time, we're going to transition to discussions of parallel computing. We'll give an overview of parallel computing and its advantages and disadvantages, a little bit of history and how it's used in CFD. We'll talk about the important concepts and terminology, all the major vocabulary you'll need to know to enter a CFD group. Finally, we'll talk about memory architectures and the different types of computers and CPUs and way data is stored in memories across different units. Thank you very much for your time today. I'm Professor Steve Miller.